Okay, welcome back to the snap. Michael Heaver here, of course, alongside my co-host Patrick O'Flynn. Patrick, lots to talk about today, but we're going to start off, I think, with uh, GB News. Nigel Farage, of course, uh, with a new show on GB News. Obviously, you've got a, a lot of had a lot of experience over the years in terms of the media world. Patrick, what do you make of GB News so far? What do you make of this announcement of this new show that debuted yesterday from Nigel Farage on GB News? Uh, well, I think it's an important uh, step forward for GB News. Uh, Nigel's show that he did on Sunday was certainly one of the most appreciated and watched of the shows. And uh, with Dehenna Davidson and Paul Embry, and they seem to, to cover issues in an interesting way. Uh, I think you saw the uh, benefit of Nigel's, whatever it was, three years doing that LBC uh, radio show every day. Uh, and that he's someone with a bit of uh, definition cut through very punchy. And I think, to be honest, GB News needed that because it was slightly sinking into a morass of too many programmes covering the same ground. It was kind of like watching uh, a perpetual, uh, slightly right of centre version of Newsnight, where everyone was sort of taking a spin on the same stories of the day. And you need characters with bigger definition and bigger punch. And I think Nigel will give them that. Yeah, I certainly think it's the way forward. They need big personalities uh, really driving that programming because I think there is definitely a space for Patrick. I mean, I know from, uh, you know, people that watch the Snap, there was a lot of excitement about GB News. Obviously, there were some teething problems. That was always bound to happen, I think. You know, launching an operation of that size is not an easy thing to do. Uh, I certainly think, as I said, that Nigel having that show now uh, lays a decent foundation. Uh, but as you say, I mean, I think, one of the feedbacks I've been getting is people would like to actually see an alternative to the BBC Six O'Clock News, for instance, an actual dedicated news programme, not just that format of people sat there talking. But look, at the end of the day, with Andrew Neil there as chairman, uh, I think, you know, the, there's definitely uh, an opportunity there for GB News to grow. And as I said, it'll be interesting to see now if there's a shake up of other shows, if there's news presenters on. But I certainly think, I remember you saying before at launch, Patrick, you know, we have to give uh, GB News benefit of the doubt. Yes, mistakes will be made. But as I said, I think this show and the feedback I've been getting certainly is that having Nigel back in that show is really a one back uh, support from people who are starting to be a bit shaky when it came to their approach to GB News, whether they were watching it or not. Yeah, and I think you're right that they need news bulletins, even if they're only 10 to 15 minutes, maybe three times a day, you know, one o'clock, six o'clock. Uh, 10 o'clock. I also would like to see more definition between the different programs that they do. So for instance, I'd like them, they could do a uh, one hour twice a week show called something like criminal justice about the law and order scams, soft sentencing, people coming out to reoffend, uh, foreign nationals coming over to commit crime, low rate convictions, whatever it would be. I don't think there's a show like that on the other channels. I think that would get an audience Maybe they could do a show called Border Control uh, to report on, on the chaotic state of the immigration system. But again, from the point of view uh, of more rigour into the system, which you wouldn't get uh, on other channels too. They could do, you know, um, the way new technology is, could benefit people, a sort of their version of a gadget show. They need more differ differentiation. You can't just expect people to watch hour after hour of the same three or four issues of the day. Uh, being knocked around by talking heads. It's all fine for an hour, and I suspect Nigel will do the best hour of that uh, daily, but then you need different angles and slants in order to retain uh, the audience. So I hope they address that before I think they'll do a big hard launch early in the autumn. Well, you mentioned immigration chaos there, Patrick, and uh, Monday, we now know we saw uh, at least 430 illegal migrants crossing the channel on small boats. That is a new record for a single day. And just to give the context now, we're nearly at 8,000 people who have used this uh, route uh, already this year. To give the context of that, 8,417 was the number in 2020 who used the, used the small boat route across the channel legally. That was up from 1,850 in 2019. In 2018, it was 297 people for the entire year so we've seen this escalate we've seen the numbers explode year after year but that really does 
say it all for me, the fact that you had on Monday 430 people crossing the channel illegally by a small boat. Back in 2018, it was 297 for the entire year. Patrick, this problem is getting worse and worse. It is. And on that trajectory, uh, you know, people talk about exponential growth in the context of COVID, in the context of irregular migration and uh, and abusing uh, the immigration and asylum system, given another couple of years of growth like this, and the numbers will be quite staggering. Uh, so, you know, a year ago, the government said it had reached agreements with France, implementing other policies uh, with the aim of completely shutting this route down. Well, the opposite has happened. It's out of control. Uh, and so lots of people who voted Conservative at the last election are tearing their hair out, are sick of all talk and no action. Uh, and yet, you know, I spent this morning ploughing through uh, the debate yesterday in the House of Commons on the Im new Immigration and Nationality Bill uh, and, and reading through, you know, Pretty Patel and the other Tories were at least talking about trying to get this under control. They were outlining a few measures which I think will have a marginal beneficial effect. They haven't ruled out the key measure, I think, which is offshore uh, processing. But if you looked at the Labour contributions, the SNP contributions, the Lib Dem contributions, they were just obsessed with the rights of people to come into our country. With they, None of them even mentioned the impact on our existing communities and way of life. So, you know, if we, we, we tear our hair out about the Tories being all talk and no action, but if you look at what the alternative is, it's 10 times worse. Yeah, and I mean, this feeds into the polls that we're seeing now, Patrick. Lots of talk from uh, left-wing commentary app who spend far too much time on Twitter and are basically uh, wrong on most of the predictions they make, if not all. There was this, uh, uh, this uh, narrative that was pushed not that long ago, quite recently, that the Tories were losing the culture war and that Labour was sort of turning the tide of mass public support. Well, the most recent YouGov poll that has just come out has the Conservatives up two points on 44% uh, compared to Labour on 31. So extending their lead to 13 points. And it's just fascinating. It's something we talk about regularly here on the Snap, Patrick. But, you know, the gap between the narrative, the delusional narrative, really, that some talk versus mainstream British public opinion, it continues. Yeah, so Labour being a party in effect proposing zero immigration controls and saying that everybody decent who's not racist should be should be kneeling down and taking the knee. Uh, and as you say, the fashionable commentators uh, seizing on sort of signs of taking the knee becoming more popular. I think a few people were telling pollsters what they knew they were meant to say. But in fact, uh, Labour becoming identified with that ultra woke positioning has knocked Labour back down right to its basement level performance. Uh, the Tories, uh, to the extent they did resist the knee taking, I think have benefited and have had a little bounce. And that will be particularly true in the more working class uh, red wall areas. So the commentariat has called it wrong again. Uh, and the fact is things haven't been going that well for the government. The, the Freedom Day announcement seems to have been polluted by this idea of compulsory vaccine passports to get into a nightclub in late autumn, which I personally doubt will ever happen. Uh, you know, there was the issue of uh, Boris Johnson trying to, uh, to exempt himself from the rules and then U-turning. But all these uh, missteps and uh, mishappenings, they won't register in the polls because Keir Starmer's leadership of the Labour Party uh, is inept, is substandard. He hasn't connected, as we have said from word go, on this uh, podcast, he's not going to be prime minister. Everyone knows that. And, and while we're stuck in this holding pattern, the government can almost get anything wrong because Labour is so far away from being a potential alternative government. Yeah, I mean, the Brexit legacy really does live on. When you dig into the Hugo poll, for instance, it's, it actually shows you, it backs up what we've been saying about this coalition that the Conservatives have built up. It shows you, in this, in this Hugo poll, 70% of Leavers currently intend to vote Conservative. Only 11% of Leavers currently intend to vote Labour. But when it comes to Remainers, fewer than half, only 46% of Remainers currently intending to vote Labour and 23% of Remainers intending to vote Conservative. Something else, which again, we've highlighted, is this trend of working class voters. 47% of working class Brits 
currently back in the Tories. That's an 18 point lead over Labour. You know, Keir Starmer's leadership was saved by a few hundred votes in that Batley and Spen by election. But these numbers across the board are absolutely diabolical for the Labour Party. Yeah, it's the basic facts of life of British politics now is the Conservatives have assembled a winning coalition. Parts of it may grumble, uh, become very annoyed with the Tories at times, but faced with a forced choice at a general election of a Conservative government led by Boris Johnson or a Labour one led by Keir Starmer, they're going to stick with the Tories all day long. And uh, Labour leavers remember Keir Starmer at the 2017 general election promising Labour would respect the referendum result. Uh, a year or so later, he was conspiring to push on a second referendum to overturn things and keep us in the EU. That kind of treachery doesn't get uh, forgiven, particularly not uh, when the person trying to be forgiven is such a wooden communicator, zero charisma. And people keep telling me they're fed up of Keir Starmer just nitpicking, unnecessary nitpicking about what was obviously a tough thing, this get battling against COVID, offering no worked out policies of his own whatsoever. Um, they've already made their mind up about him. Well, as ever, guys, hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, make sure you hit subscribe and the bell so you don't miss the next episode of The Snap. Myself and Patrick will be back soon. Thanks, guys. See you soon, everyone.